long on the Jewish community in Skokie Wharf that happened as a result of this. And going into the project, um, I expected that most of the people that most of the people that everyone would have been following in this case pretty closely and that there would be a mixture of just anger and fear as the primary response and just a uniformly hostile reaction to the Nazis marching there and expected somewhat of a mixed position on the ACLU and that some but not all would say that they participated in activism because they were relieved when and the Nazis it said that they weren't going to march in Skokie. I expected that most would, but whether they expected the Nazis to say that they weren't going to march in Skokie, I expected most people to say that they had been surprised by that. And most people would say that they did feel less safe as Jews in the US because of this. And overall, the takeaways I had from these interviews were that. Everyone in Skokie, for the most part, believed that it was being targeted due to its Jewish population and its large population of Holocaust survivors. Most people were not aware that Frank Collin had attempted to march in Chicago first, or they reached out to suburbs other than Skokie. And the dominant perspective was that he was choosing to march in Skokie solely because of its Jewish population. And Plenty of this was reinforced by the Nazis' own actions. I spoke to um, a rabbi who had been a rabbi in Skokie since 1971, Rabbi Neil Brief, who described this to me saying that I was a rabbi in Skokie in 1971 when suddenly one night on a Friday night, as people were leaving the synagogue, the windshields were plastered with the sign that the neo-Nazis were going to march in Skokie and they were notifying us of it. So they intentionally did this when people were coming out of Friday night services and they would come back to their car, the Nazis were coming. And the general reaction of everyone in the community was that this is why that they had chosen to be there. Um, one of the interviews who I spoke to Jeffrey Butler said, the only reason they picked Skokie was because there were a large number of Jewish people there. And more than that, there were a large number of that number that were Holocaust survivors. And so people viewed this as a targeted and direct threat on Skokie by this group. However, most of them did not feel personally threatened by the marchers and instead saw the marchers as a joke and, ins and an insignificant group. Um, they recognized that the marchers were a very small group, that the Nazi membership it was very small and had no real ability to um, enact political change or threaten, or threaten the community as a whole. And you know, Jeffrey Butler again said that there were maybe 20 of them and said it was a laughable number. Other people said that these... You know, other people said stuff along the lines of that the, these people were, that Frank Collin was a wannabe, it was a wannabe playing dress up as Hitler. And that there were people who were saying that just these were a bunch of cowards seeking publicity. And overall, so most people did not actually feel personally threatened by this. However, um, the... Holocaust survivors and children of survivors who I interviewed expressed that the survivors in particular did feel very threatened by this. And that was the general sense in the community as well, that, that these people were, that these people were much more vulnerable to this and that they didn't want them to relive the trauma of the past. And this was summed up by Howard Reich, uh, who was a college student at Northwestern at the time and who was from Skokie, who said that I kind of automatically dismissed Frank Collin as a clown. I thought of him as a guy who was a pretend wannabe Nazi. I thought of him as insignificant, whereas my parents and the other survivors of Skokie were terrified by uh, him. Uh, and it took a long time, years or decades, before I could understand why, because to me, 
He was just this absurd media figure on TV with not a lot of financial or other support, but to survivors like my parents, this was an exact replay of what happened just a few decades earlier because Colin and his minions were wearing brown shirts and swastikas and saying they were coming to get them. So to the people who were already traumatized, that uh, was just re-triggering that trauma. For them, it was real. It may as well have been Hitler threatening to march there. So that was the primary focus of the concern, yeah, of the concern in there. And I did get the chance to speak to one survivor, Judy Patel, who had, whose family had fled Austria in 1939 and whose dad had been a prisoner in Dachau. And just that overall, <coughs> And that she said that he lost many nights of sleep, but many nights of sleep over the March in Skokie. And then let's see. So while not all Jews were active in the efforts to stop the march, many were, especially rabbis who were active from the pulpit. Rabbi Breek, who I mentioned earlier, had a correspondence going with Jimmy Carter asking him to come to Skokie to um, speak out against the march. Other rabbis were relying just on the pulpit and their congregations. And plenty of people were engaged in going to, going to protests and going to letter writing campaigns to go and lobby support. However, many also remained on the sidelines, but the primary focus of this was at the April 30th March, which was the closest they came to March in, in Skokie. And there was just this massive mobilization of the community that was sent out there. Rabbi Brief said that um, there were two bar mitzvahs occurring at the synagogue that he led that day when someone came in and said that the Nazis are coming and we and everyone should go down to should go down to village hall to stop them. And we're trying to get people to come out of there. And that oh, many of the people I spoke with were at the April 30th protest. And there was just this large sense of largely peaceful activism, but some of this did extend to violence as well. I spoke to him, one of the people I spoke to, Leo Pearl, um, said that there would have been a bloodbath if they had come and that, and that they can and that the Nazis can only understand violence and that's all that groups like that could understand. And one of the people I spoke to, Belle Holman, said that her 17 year old son said that he was going to go out there and smash a couple heads, but that she had to keep him in the house and not allow him to go out because he was going to do that. And another person I spoke to, Ralph Silver, said that um, people at 10 a.m. got out of, since this was on a Saturday, got out of Saturday services to go down to stop uh, the Nazis and that they were armed and that the rabbi of the synagogue had to run out and stop them and tell them that they weren't going to do this and that he would go there as the representative instead. And some of this, and some of this was heavily encouraged by the Jewish Defense League. Mike Kahane came to Skokie, Skokie to speak and said that he was promising violence. And some of the people I spoke to said that they were armed by the Jewish Defense League and that they were, and Leo Pearl, who I mentioned earlier, said that Rabbi Kahane was passing out baseball bats and that he was one of the people who had, who took one them from them. The person I spoke to from the Jewish Defense League refused to speak on the subject, but just, and overall, so there was this undercurrent of violence, but it wasn't the dominant perspective. And there was some hostility to the ACLU, but most people understood that they were doing what it felt like they needed to do. Plenty of the people who I talked to said that they had canceled their memberships, but most said that they had renewed them a couple years later. And most of the people of Skokie were genuinely relieved that they didn't come and many of them viewed that they didn't come because they were cowards. The person I spoke to from the JDL attributes Frank Collin not much in Skokie due to the thought that he would be killed by the JDL if he did, because they had gone down to his office in Chicago and were trying to force him out, uh, out but were stopped by police officers. And he said that that's what was the triggering moment for him not marching in Skokie. And overall, the leadership of Skokie, especially 
its mayor at the time, Al Smith, were praised. And Al Smith was especially praised because he was a Catholic and that this was just seen as this incredible thing that someone who wasn't part of the Jewish community was standing up for the Jews in Skokie so much. And the current mayor of Skokie, Mayor Van Dusen, said that the march probably took 10 years off of Al Smith's life just because of the amount of stress they went through and the effort they put into this. And the last scene effect of and the last scene effect of this that brought the that this brought the village together. And this caused Holocaust survivors to be more open about their experiences. It led to a Holocaust memorial being made in Skokie and the Holocaust Museum being placed there. And it led to Illinois passing a law requiring Holocaust education in schools and it being the first. And it also led to a lot of interfaith dialogue and just a growing sense of multiculturalism in Skokie, in Skokie that made Skokie a welcoming community to everyone. And just in general, that this was a very strengthening experience for the community of Skokie. And that that's it. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I always love, I mean, I've been hearing you speak about this all semester, and I'm so glad that you could share it with everybody else. Um, so thank you so much. And let us now hear from Leah about her research as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I sent my slides to Ariana. I don't know. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so my presentation is entitled like a snapshot of a bigger picture, oral history and the role of the individual. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, starting out with some acknowledgements. Uh, I think some people are doing this at the end, but I'll do it at the beginning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Vermeglish and Dr. Tetro. She's not here, but uh, Dr. Vermeglish is here. Uh, I've been uh, working with them on their research for almost a year now as a undergraduate research assistant. I've been summarizing oral interviews. Uh, that's kind of where this started um, and just have really appreciated the opportunity uh, that they've given me the mentoring over this whole last year. It's been really important with COVID too because I mean, we're not on campus. Uh, it's nice to feel connected still uh, to faculty. Uh, so thank you again. Also, Another part, so this project is sort of two projects in one, which you'll see as I uh, continue here. Uh, but I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Weiland, Dr. Wolf, and Dr. Margolis for uh, our seminar. That's the other part of this project was the undergraduate uh, honors undergraduate seminar on digital history, uh, digital testimony in the Holocaust. So that's the other part of this. So thank you again uh, for the discussion uh, in that class. I really enjoyed it and I'm still finishing uh, that project up, but it is mentioned here. Uh, also, as I have listed here, two scholarships uh, that also made the research possible. So the Provost Undergraduate Research Initiative Grant, the PROI Grant last summer, uh, as well as the Leadership Council's Sophomore Research uh, Scholarship. Uh, and then finally, the title of my presentation. Uh, actually, I will have to credit my boyfriend with that we were discussing oral history and he said that and it was like perfect so I wanted to use it uh, and I, I wanted to quote since it's all about oral history um so yeah let's get started for the next slide again start of my research uh it's kind of unconventional uh so this is sort of like the marriage of two uh oral history projects that just somehow coincidentally go well together uh, so I worked, like I mentioned before, as an undergraduate research assistant with Dr. Vermeglish and Dr. Tetro on their project on internal migration of Jewish academics uh, to the Lansing area. So that's kind of one part. I summarized those interviews. Uh, and then again, the undergraduate honors seminar on digital testimony in the Holocaust, uh, and mostly the use of the USC show archive as a source. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, some research questions. It's kind of an unconventional project, but as I began working on uh, summarizing oral histories, uh, I was asking myself, so what do we gain 
from oral histories as a historical source, uh, especially when we compare oral history to written documents, which are usually what we look at as historians. Um, what opportunities do oral histories offer historically underrepresented groups like Jews? Uh, and then what are the limitations or weaknesses of oral histories? Uh, so the primary sources that I worked with that I looked at, I have listed here uh, a couple of the USC show archive interviews. I listened to Larry Flynn, a Holocaust survivor from Romania, as well as Rahel Huber, um, actually another Romanian survivor. And then I have listed here several of the interviews uh, conducted by Dr. Fermeglish and Dr. Tetro, uh, Don Kaufman, Judy Shulman, uh, Liz Kaufman, and Betty Menchik. Some of the secondary sources I looked at, uh, the Oral History Association's website, which has a lot of good resources on it, uh, as well as a, the article Objectionable Traits on Anti-Semitism and the Hiring of Jewish Psychologists from 1920 to 1950. That article is by Andrew Winston. Also looked at Why Are Jews Preeminent in Science and Scholarship? The Veblen Thesis Reconsidered. Uh, and that was written by David Hollinger. And then War and Genocide, A Concise History of the Holocaust uh, by Doris Bergen, which is the book we used for uh, the undergraduate research seminar, but it's also the book that uh, Dr. Simon is using for uh, our History of the Holocaust class. So that has given me good background. Uh, starting out with uh, some a look at the second one of the secondary sources uh, that I read for background. Uh, this was uh, Winston's, um, Winston's article on anti-Semitism uh, and hiring Jewish psychologists. So uh, his argument about um, anti-Semitism and hiring, and that's sort of, uh, that was good background for uh, Dr. Fermeglish's work research. So that's why I read this article. Uh, I was especially interested in what sources Winston used. Uh, so the sources that he relied on were the correspondence and the letters from anti-Semitic faculty themselves, which are fascinating. They're a great resource. He uses them uh, very well in his uh, argument. Uh, but for myself, I guess what I was asking was uh, it's like, why did he use those sources? What other sources maybe could he have used? Uh, so we're giving the microphone, we're listening to the voices of the anti-Semites here. Um, could we maybe have listened to the Jews and what uh, their perspective, uh, basically whose voice are we listening to? And that'll come into play uh, further in my presentation. So keep that in mind and we can keep going here. So next on to some of the findings, uh, some of the primary resources. Uh, so the research questions that I had for one of my projects, uh, my the undergraduate research seminar, uh, were how did the Holocaust serve as a motivation for Jewish survivors to support Zionist movements, um, as well as what can survivor testimony from the USC show archive teach us about survivors and support for Zionist movements after the war. Uh, so to answer those questions, I looked at uh, testimony from the USC show archives. So I listened to some oral interviews. Uh, the first one being Larry Flynn's interview. Uh, he recounted feeling convinced very strongly by the Zionist leaders in uh, he, I listened to his experience in a displaced persons camp. Uh, so that's kind of the context here. Uh, within the camp, he was convinced very strongly by Zionist leaders there that the Jews needed their own country uh, to defend against being in his words, slaughtered like sheep. He remembered feeling like he had nowhere to go, that nobody wanted uh, Jews after the war. Um, there's a huge refugee crisis. Uh, they were looking for, you know, where do you go next um, after surviving the Holocaust? Uh, we don't have our own state. Everybody can do with us what they want. Um, so these feelings of helplessness um, to go back to those countries who are so murderous, full of Jewish blood, I would never go there. Um, so how can you stay in Europe in places where your neighbors turned against you, um, the places of the trauma? So very fascinating to hear uh, a survivor themselves uh, recount uh, these feelings, uh, kind of this larger Zionist movement, but from the perspective of, you know, a Jew, an individual, a kind of ordinary individual 
we might not hear uh, his perspective, but when you listen to the interviews, uh, you do get those sorts of perspectives, which are very fascinating. We can go to the next one. Uh, so Rahel Huber too, she's also a Romanian survivor. She didn't speak about it as much, but it was also her uh, experience within a displaced persons camp as well after the war. Uh, she rem remembered that the aim within the camp uh, was always to go to Israel. So these camps were a hotbed of Zionist activity. Uh, at that time, she remembers anyone who survived concentration camps or Germans in any form, they wanted to go to Israel. So she recounts similar uh, sentiment within the displaced persons camp that she uh, was in after the Holocaust as well. And then my the second kind of part of uh, my presentation here, as far as the sources that I looked at, were also the sources, uh, the oral interviews that Dr. Vermelish and Dr. Dr. Tetro conducted uh, with um, local Jews. So we kind of have uh, a diverse look at different oral histories, uh, not just Holocaust survivors, but also like local Jewish academics. And so here, uh, these are excerpts from a couple of the interviews, uh, interviews with Don Kaufman and with Judy B. Shulman. Uh, so again, larger phenomena, this time instead of Zionism, uh, individual instances of anti-Semitism. And I will read uh, Don Kaufman's quote here. I tried to keep all the quotations, uh, you know, exactly to what people said uh, so that, you know, accurately reflects what they said. Um, Don Kaufman remembered uh, as a kid, a number of times in junior high and high school, kids walking around me and looking at me. And I said, what are you looking for? Oh, we're looking to see if you have horns and a tail. So here we have an example, um, common anti-Semitic trope uh, that Don Kaufman experienced as a kid. Uh, he goes on, he had some other instances to mention. I was interviewed at USC and the professor who interviewed me asked, do you think we have quotas against Jews? And I said, I don't think you have quotas against Jews. I know you have quotas against Jews. I said, it's a well-known fact and I got rejected the next day. So again, sort of the, a uh, lot of the research I was doing, the background research was on uh, anti-Semitic quotas. Um, so it was very interesting for me to hear it straight from uh, even someone from the local Lansing area who also experienced it. Um, and as far as anti-Semitism goes, Judy Shulman too also had an individual uh, example. She remembered uh, a boyfriend from, I think it was high school or college, I'm not completely sure, I would have to check, uh, but she remembered uh, her boyfriend's little sister uh, saying, could she ask me something? I thought it was gonna be about her hair or her nails or something. And she asked me if I would mind showing her my horns. I didn't know what she was talking about at first. So again, uh, the same kind of trope uh, from another person, a uh, Jew from the Lansing area. So a larger uh, phenomena, but like on an individual scale. And if we could go to the next slide. Uh, so a couple more examples, uh, Liz Kaufman, Judy Shulman again, uh, and Betty Menchik, uh, interviews with them. Uh, we have individuals as part of, a, of larger political movements. Uh, which is another larger phenomenon that we can look at a lot of individual examples from, and not just these interviews, but, uh, so I've listened to you know, quite a few, and there's plenty of examples uh, of this. So the example I've listed here, Betty Menchik, uh, remembered that both her grandmothers were very involved in League of Women Voters. Uh, she said it was practically a birthright. I belong to now uh, for years and subscribed to Miss uh, from the beginning. And it may be, uh, the, the spelling might be incorrect. I would have to check that, but you're probably right there. Um, but a lot of uh, a lot of the interviewees spoke about uh, feminist organizations they were involved in, uh, protests against the Vietnam War, um, civil rights protests, and we know that uh, Jews played a, a large part in a lot of those political movements. But it's a story that we don't always hear. So that's one way that the interviews can be used uh, to study that kind of movement. Uh, stories of Jewish converts too. There are many interviews uh, with Jewish converts in the, La uh, the Lansing area. Liz Kaufman uh, was one of them. So she uh, remembered feeling a little concerned uh, if her parents would have been disappointed 
in her converting. Uh, but remember then in retrospect, they probably couldn't have cared less. So those stories are also um, underrepresented, I would argue. Uh, also potential study of secular Jews. A lot of the interviewers, uh, interviewees rather, were secular Jews and they talked about um, you know, being part of a synagogue or a Jewish community um, without uh, the belief in God. Judy Shulman remembered, uh, I really don't believe in God, this is her quotation from her. I'm surprised that I ended up so embraced in the synagogue where I argue so much in my mind. And she had other stories too about um, being a secular Jew. Uh, she enjoyed ritual, despite the fact that she didn't, uh, you know, maybe believe in the religious element of it. Go to the next slide. Uh, so those are sort of uh, examples and now to some conclusions to wrap up. So interesting, like I said, I kind of was working on two different projects, uh, quite different, but the, the sort of source uh, was similar. And that's kind of why these paired so well. Uh, both projects credit oppression and anti-Semitism as motivation. Uh, for political and uh, community mo movements. Uh, so whether that's the oppression and anti-Semitism of the Holocaust leading to uh, Zionist movements or uh, just anti-Semitism, uh, not necessarily anti-Semitism, but the oppression uh, of moving to a community that this is more so uh, the interviews with the community in Lansing. Uh, you know, they didn't have a large community in the Lansing area. so they took the oppression of uh, being part of that minority and it fueled uh, a movement to build a, a local community themselves. So that's sort of similar. And, and again, like I've kind of been trying to say this whole time, we're understanding larger phenomena, but from the perspective of the individuals who were involved. So ordinary and oppressed individuals, specifically uh, of a historically oppressed group. So, Jewish individuals specifically. Uh, which brings us to uh, oral history's big strengths, uh, which I would argue are highlighting the oppressed and ordinary in history. Uh, so again, uh, the strength to me is inc including the groups who have traditionally been excluded uh, from the narrative uh, of history. So I would ask who's better qualified to speak on your community than members of that community? Uh, who should we be listening to uh, when we're studying Jewish history? Uh, I would argue that we should be listening to the Jews. Um, in Holocaust studies, there's a lot of emphasis on, uh, you know, Hitler. There's so many books written about Hitler and um, all of the Jew, uh, the Nazis. Uh, but, you know, to look at the survivors instead, I think is important to do, and I think it's empowering. Um, so yeah, who's better qualified to speak on your own community? And this, going back to Winston's, uh, the source from the beginning, uh, I think that he did a good job of using the letters of rec from uh, anti-Semitic faculty, uh, and that was good for his purpose, but I would argue that it's better practice and more empowering to interview and to look at sources from the community who's being oppressed rather than the people who are doing the oppressing. Uh, again, also ordinary individuals in the role, uh, the value rather of their accounts in the scheme of history. It's another one of oral history's uh, big strengths in my opinion. I have a quote here, uh, students need to see history as populated not simply by quasi mythical figures, but by three dimensional human beings the famous as well as the forgotten. We can go to the next slide. Uh, some more strengths, uh, and I don't have too much time to touch on this, and it's not really a main argument here, but uh, the limitations of language, and I think we talk about this a lot uh, for Holocaust studies. Sometimes what can you say? Uh, words fail us, um, but when you listen to somebody in an interview, you can get you know, emo different kinds of emotion uh, body language if you're looking at somebody. Uh, so oral history also, that's a strength too, I would argue. We can keep going here. And here I have a whole slide uh, 
dedicated to the Oral History Association statement on diversity and inclusivity, uh, because that's sort of the big take home point that I wanna drive home. Uh, and or the Oral History Association uh, recognizes uh, the strength in uh, diversity and inclusivity uh, in their sources. So uh, our membership is committed to documenting personal narratives of complex and diverse histories and advocating for a collaborative practice of oral history, which values and honors people, communities, subjects, and events that otherwise might not be included in the historical record. Uh, now that brings us to limitations. Uh, so it wouldn't be fair not to talk about some of oral history's limitations. Uh, no source, uh, no source is uh, devoid of limitation. Uh, issues of memory are probably the most widely cited when it comes to oral history. A lot of the interviewees are older, uh, especially uh, Holocaust survivors. Uh, the USC show archive itself was designed to to save those testimonies before we lose all Holocaust survivors. Um, human memory can fail us. Uh, you know, even in any kind of conversation, we might remember things inaccurately. Um, so people do argue that that is one of oral history's limitations. Um, also fact checking as we're speaking doesn't always happen. Like it might happen when you're writing. Uh, there's potential for ethics violations. And I talked to uh, Dr. Fermeglish and Dr. Tetro about this as uh, they were doing their research. So, you know, who wants to remain anonymous? Uh, consent forms when you're uh, interviewing people. Um, are you asking leading questions? Uh, those kinds of things. Again, all sources have certain issues and oral history is not excluded from those issues. Um, all sources have issues like bias, uh, personal agendas and that kind of thing. So you have to be aware of that. Um, and sources are best used, as I have written here, uh, in combination with one another in order to check for discrepancies and uh, confirm other statements. And oral history, too, uh, is best used in combination with other sources. Uh, so kind of wrapping up here uh, on some of oral history's possibilities today, I think uh, in talking here about oral history strength being uh, diversity and inclusivity. Um, how can oral history help us uh, to maybe continue the change we're seeing in history curriculum? And that is an interest of mine. Uh, we are seeing, I would argue, increased emphasis on diverse perspectives in history. Uh, I would cite like the 1619 project. There are efforts to uh, improve uh, our history education and sort of get away from the American exceptionalism narrative uh, and highlight some groups like Jews in their history and how they uh, factor into America as well. Uh, possibly maybe someday we won't need to have a class solely on American Jewish history because we offer that and I took that class um, and maybe those stories will be in the actual you know like in the wider American history course if you want to keep going. So here's my last slide. Uh, as historians of Jewish history, oral history can serve an especially important role. Uh, again, tr traditional history and the traditional narrative uh, does not always include a place for Jews, especially. Uh, and maybe they're included, but that would be in the margins or the footnotes of the larger story. Um, and I would say that young historians and students of history have a responsibility to change the way that we learn and that we think about history. So. Uh, it's up to historians and teachers and students today, I think, to um, make the effort to include uh, different perspectives, including the Jewish perspective. So just to wrap up, I hope that you might consider using oral history sources uh, in future projects. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Leah. That was wonderful. And I want to say, first of all, that uh, it's it's great that you ended on that note because this is one of my if you if anybody takes my Jews and anti-semitism class one of the things I go back to over and over again is the fact that um you know you can study the whole history of Spain and you can study the whole history of I don't know of of Christianity and never talk about anti-semitism and never talk about the role of Jews and the things that 
happened to Jews in those places. And all my students are like, oh my gosh, you're right. I have studied, I'm a Spanish major and I never knew about the Spanish expulsion. I didn't even know there were Jews in Spain, right? And so students, depending on what their interests are, you know, are throughout the semester, you know, surprised by the fact that there were Jews that had like really, you know, wonderful experiences, also horrible experiences in the places or in the histories that they feel like they already know. And they kind of feel like they've been lied to <laughs> because they didn't know, you know, this one part of the history, which is in integral, right? Not just marginal, um, the way that you say, Leah. So I really appreciate that. And I agree that oral testimony is one way um, that we can seek to remedy that. I'm going to start with one question um, that kind of works for both of our, our, our presenters and then, you know, open it up for other questions which is I'm really struck in the presentations here um, that, you know, Josh's presentation was very much um, content driven and less, you know, discussed less about the theory behind it. And then Leah's was much more theory driven and discussed much more about the theory behind oral testimony. Not surprisingly, because you did the digital testimony class where that's kind of the whole point, right, of, of understanding the value and, and general um, ideas about uh, uh, you know, benefits and limitations of oral testimony. So what I'm going to ask is for Josh to talk for a minute about the benefits and limitations, the way that he's seen it of oral testimony in his project, or, you know, a secondary, you know, the way that he's conceptualized oral testimony, because he didn't talk so much about that. And to ask Leah a little bit more about the research questions driving, uh, you know, the, the impetus for going to oral testimony, right? So not just the benefits and, and, um, and, uh, and problems with it, but also, you know, what were you trying to investigate and why? You know where your volume is. I think it's different in both cases. So, um, you know, you can address one or both of those. Why don't we start with Josh and then, you know, go to Leah. So thinking about like I said, in particular, benefits or limitations of oral testimony as a particular way of gathering historical information or as a particular historical source in your project? So I would say that the benefit of oral testimony is that while the official written histories do a good job of documenting the events of the case, they don't do an amazing job of documenting their effect on the people who were there. Like I said, um, as someone from Skokie, I had this big awareness of the case and this general understanding of some of the steps involved in it. And by reading books and articles on it, I was able to develop a good understanding of the timeline. But um, with a couple exceptions, though it was difficult to fully conceptualize of what it was like to be a Jew, a Jew in Skokie at the time, especially because um, the written histories of the event necessarily focus on the people who were most active in the event itself. And there isn't much about someone who lived in Skokie but didn't go to any, any of the events or someone who went to this one protest but didn't come back or was on, or someone who, on the people I spoke to, who it, her and her husband were very busy just with work and their family and all that. And, and they were unable to fully commit all their time. So they were involved in, in collecting signatures and writing letters, but that doesn't make their contribution to this moment in history any less important. And understanding that most people aren't going to be the big name activists who are making the, who are making the headlines is just an important thing to understand in the history of just anything that happens inside of a community. So I'd say that that's what makes in the oral histories especially important for a situation such as this. Thanks so much. And I actually wanted to add just one quick thing also, which is that, for example, with the USC Shoah Foundation, right, the Holocaust was this huge event. So there have been all these projects like that to record. But something like the Skokie March and the Jewish community responses, right? You can investigate anything with oral testimony that other people may not have thought as historically important or interesting. Or, you know, Holocaust is a case where everybody knows, right? This is, is, is such a dramatic event. But of course, you know, and, and people, you know, have written about it. But, you know, there's, you know, on a smaller scale, it's not necessarily a reason that people wrote memoirs about the Skokie March, right? So you really only have 
sometimes oral testimony, which I think is really interesting too. All right, Leah. Um, I think I understand your question. Uh, it's about like my motivation for uh, like the questions I asked of my research. Is yes, that... exactly. Yeah, so uh, going, I was interested, uh, I mean, interested in Zionism generally. Interesting. Uh, I feel like I've learned a lot about it from, uh, I took uh, two courses on the Middle East my first year at MSU, and I learned a lot about it in the second half of it, because that's timeline wise, that's when we would learn about it. Um, but I was interested in it rather uh, like from the perspective, again, of uh, like survivors, be like anti-Semitism is, you know, cited as like a justification for uh, Israel. Um, it's part of the narrative uh, of the founding of Israel as an, a state. So I was interested to hear um, maybe what it meant to survivors, like personally, um, personally what it meant to them. Uh, I just want to hear it from uh, their words. And that's why I chose that as my uh, research question. Just the general interest in the subject. And then I think it's important to listen, like I kind of talked about, listen to it uh, from the people uh, who, uh, you know, actually experienced the Holocaust. Excellent, thank you. And I think, again, it's one of those instances where it's a part of the story, although people talk about the Holocaust a lot that, you know, might get erased, if not for somebody coming and asking the questions and then trying to listen for those answers. So thank you very much. Um, Mark, you are muted still. Very unmuted, sorry. Wonderful presentations. And it's something I know nothing about uh, in terms of oral, oral histories. I wish I, unfortunately, the, the project I'm working on, everybody's dead, <laughs> but um, I wish I had 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 a, had a chance to do oral histories. It's a, a project on a uh, shtetl in in Belarus, today's Belarus. Um, it was really cool. I thought that both of you got to learn and master the techniques, the methodology of oral history. I think it's amazing that as undergraduates, you've already been exposed to this and, and learned how to do it. Um, I had a couple of questions. One for for Joshua. Um, do you think in the end the protest and the resistance to allowing the march to take place, um, in fact, was counterproductive. Um, and that it, in that you mentioned it attracted Frank Collins attention, you know, then he Dafka, you know, deliberately wanted to do it in Skokie because they resist, they didn't want it there. And it also gave them a much larger, the, the, the publicity afterwards gave them a much larger national platform. Um, and I was just, I was, while you were talking, I looked up, I looked up the uh, David Goldberger, who was the attorney for the ACLU at the time. And he had an amazing, you know, an amazing account of the, um, of the trial. And, and yet, you know, the, the threats he was, he being a Jew, uh, lead lawyer for the ACLU, subject to all sorts of, uh, you know, anti, 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 anti free speech, <laughs> um, issues. Um, the other thing I was just going to ask was the uh, the international. I was wondering if the international context had anything to do with you know what was going on. There was in terms of Israel it was after the seventy three war, which was traumatic for many Israelis and for many Jews around the world because it was it punctured the myth of invincib Israeli invincibility. Um, and two, the nineteen seventy five UN resolution equating Zionism with racism, which was adopted by a large majority of countries uh, in the UN. So that was for um, Josh, if I could uh, just also add for, um, sorry, where's my questions for Lee? I just had it up here. Uh, right. I was wondering, I, I really enjoy. And this is a very. But, but in the title, I think, of your talk or your presentation, and maybe this will be for, you know, if you ever decide to publish it, I think it would be helpful to have something about the, the content. You know, you, you, the title captures the theoretical issues, um, like, a, you know, like a snapshot of a bigger picture, oral history, and the role of the individual. But I think it would be helpful to have, you know, the, the dual project content that you have, you know, the Holocaust and anti-Semitism uh, there as well. 
And just another question, I see that uh, Judy Shulman, I think is on. So I would be really fascinated to hear from her what her experience was being an interviewee um, for the project. Well, thank you. That was caught me by surprise. Sorry, I didn't mean to put um, you no, on the spot. Kirsten and Chantel can tell you a lot of it. I felt really grateful as it unfolded because we had a very long interview. How much of it my age now and having arrived here at a rather young age, I was 29 when I came, how much of my own sense of community, Jewish and other, and history unfolded for me during the experience. So I really felt it was an opportunity to review a lot of what had happened. It reminded me of things I hadn't thought about. And for me, it also grounded me, um, Kirsten will remember, we talked not just about Jewish community. What were some of the primary sources of community for me? And that was Jewish community in the Old West Side. So I found it really interesting and felt more that they had given me an opportunity than that I had given them information. It also gave me a sense of my age because, <laughs> no, not in a bad way. Um, it was just, I span a lot of years here. And I think partly, and I say this in a good way, partly, um, because of being Jewish and partly other experiences, I tend to always view myself as the other, the outsider. Um, that's just my general view of myself, even within my close-knit communities. And going through over 40 years of history here made me rethink that a little bit. And then, you know, there were things from my past growing up, some anti-Semitism I encountered that I didn't realize some of the younger people may not have encountered that. I guess that surprised me. Some specifics that were dramatic did not have large impact, I think, on my life. But when asked to remember, they were front and center. Um, Okay, so can Amy, I, Amy, can I, Amy, can I answer Steve? Mark's question? Wait, wait, hold on, Steve, what is it? I want to sneak in a comment on oral history as a method. Is that okay? Um, can I answer Mark's <laughs> questions first before we go too far away from this? Oh. Yeah, I think one, Josh wants to keep the track and then, yeah, and then we'll go back. Yeah, Josh, go ahead. Um, so thank you for asking those, Mark. And um, so the first question is an especially interesting one because I want to turn that one on its head, the question of, whether this was a bad thing for Skokie. Because when I interviewed David Goldberg, who I interviewed him yesterday, um, that when, eh, and that when I interviewed eh, him, he, I ended up asking essentially the reverse of that question, where, because, where given that I had talked to all these people who said that the, the activism against the march, even if, the Nazis won their case that the activism against the march brought Skokie together as a community and made it and caused this activism among Holocaust survivors who felt more comfortable and more driven to share their stories and brought increased just the sense of the community in Skokie led to the construction of the Holocaust Museum and legislation on Holocaust education and that at the same time time that the ACLU won a major legal battle that established a, precedence for first, a precedent for First Amendment cases that they were able to go and use in subsequent cases. And that overall, as far as the Nazis go, that Frank Collins group ended up dis disintegrating soon after because they ended up being humiliated by the idea that they were afraid to march in Skokie even after they one the right there, and that even when they marched in Chicago, they were dropped by counter pro protesters. So I ended up asking David Goldberger whether he thinks that Skokie was better off to have been doing this activism against the Nazis marching there and to do these strong attempts to prevent the Nazis from marching there. And even if his even if he's convinced that he's legally right, whether he would and whether he thinks that Skokie as a community is better because of this of this opposition to 
the Nazis and his representation of them. And he said that he was not ready to think of it in those terms and that he didn't want to think of it in those terms. But that's sort of the conclusion that I've gathered from this because the Nazis didn't march in Skokie. The Holocaust, uh, the Holocaust survivors in Skokie all uh, did not have to deal with that. And the Jews of Skokie all expressed relief that they didn't uh, march there. But so the negative effects I don't feel were really felt, but there were such strong positive impacts of it that ended up turning Skokie into this wonderful community that it is today. So I'd say that the that even if the Nazis, even if one believes that the Nazis did have the constitutional right to march in Skokie that was legally established for them, that Skokie was that Skokie ended up having such enormous benefit from preventing them from marching there that it really was worth all of what went into that. And as for the international perspective, I find this especially interesting because I interviewed um, a woman who at the time was from Skokie, but shortly after this started, went on a backpacking trip throughout Europe. And so she ended up seeing the international perspective on this firsthand because she was seeing this news coverage in other countries just of the idea that the Nazis were marching in Skokie because this was this international thing. And these countries that were that where Nazis marching would not be something that anyone would consider that were swastikas, someone wearing a swastika was something that no one would even consider as a possibility because it was illegal. And she said that people in other countries just, that people in other countries that when she said, and she was from Skokie, knew where she was talking about, this small, this small suburb of Chicago that even people from Michigan don't know about now when I try and say where I'm from at MSU. <laughs> and people in countries in Europe knew, knew where this was. And she was seeing sub news broadcasts from her hometown on, uh, on the news in, in these countries in Europe. So it definitely was something that was very contextualized in an international in an international setting. I don't really know whether um, how much of it was driven by how much of it was driven by, as you said, just feelings of vulnerability surrounding uh, surrounding the uh, the Yom Kippur War and surrounding the UN resolution on anti-Semitism. Uh, well on like on the UN resolution on like Israel and all that. I don't know whether this was something that it was a part of it, but I will definitely look into that. Great, thank you so much. Um, that's really interesting that you happen to find somebody with the backpacking, which is again, what's so cool about oral testimonies because you never know what you're gonna get, right? And I always say this, every time I look at the Shoah Foundation, I learned something I didn't know and I've been studying the Holocaust for 20 years. So it's very, very cool. Um, I know we have to go soon. Our next panel is at 1130, um, but I also see hands from Professor Vermeglish and Aronoff. So um, uh, Professor Vermeglish, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I conscious of time, I just wanted to say how great these papers were. Um, I had personal interest in Leah's, obviously, but also Josh, I, I wanted to say that I, I, um, I teach about Skokie every year, actually, and I show students the film, a clip from the film, and I was going to ask, like, if it, ha I actually was kind of curious whether you talked to people about how they felt about this kind of fame, right? Um, you know, for anybody who knows, I remember watching this movie, this TV movie in the uh, 70s uh, about the Skokie trial or about Skokie and and it really sort of highlights the survivors the, the part that I show people so I'm curious whether they talked about how that they internalized that and then I also just want to say just as American Jewish historian representative here like what you're doing like in, in to follow up on what Dr. Simon is saying it's actually research that hasn't been done that if you pursued it it could be publishable like this is like stuff that people have not done people have not actually done a lot with with just the experience of holocaust survivors in america like what their experiences were like in america um this is something i'm actually considering pursuing myself is sort of thinking about communities of holocaust survivors and you're actually tracing that so if you're interested, get in touch with me. I mean, I'd be happy to talk with you about thinking about how you could make this into something that you could go further with if you if you want to, no, no, no pressure. Um, and I also just wanted to say to Leah, I know that you're interested in doing research further. Have you thought about um, 
doing oral history? Do you want to do oral history? And what kinds of lessons have you learned from this in terms of how you would go ahead and pursue this? This is kind of the question that Amy is asking you, but it's thinking in the future, what do you think about this you would sort of pursue? And, and um, have you learned anything that maybe you'd do differently? Um, that's maybe hard for you to answer with me here, but you can say it, right? Like, what, what, what do you think about this in terms of like pursuing your own research? Because that, that's, you know, something that you would be actually doing your own oral histories and it would be different from both of the experiences that you've had. So those are kind of questions. I, thank you guys so much because you did a fabulous job. We're so proud of you. <laughs> you did great. Thank you. And I just want to say that um, almost, I would say a significant majority, um, I didn't even go so far as to say almost every person that I talked to mentioned that I should go and see the movie Skilky. It stars Danny Kay in it. And they all were very enthusiastic about, about this. They all, um, the, out of the few things that were like in common between almost all these in, interviews, like there were that the two most bizarrely common things that were mentioned were when they were given the rationale for why the Nazis shouldn't march in Skokie, so most of them said that you shouldn't be able to march in Skokie because you can't yell fire in a crowded theater and all, they just independently came up with that comparison all on their own just time and again and then they and then inevitably at some point in this interview they would mention have you seen the movie Skokie you should you should see it it stars Danny Kay and that oh, which meant a lot to these people that Danny Kay was in a movie about them and that this and also some of the people um, a lot of the people who I interviewed due to who I was able to get in touch with like because uh, due to synagogues and all that a lot of the people um, were from in Temple Judea as part of the synagogue where apparently a large portion of the Skokie movie was shot at and they were all very proud of that and they said that they knew people who had appeared like as extras in the film so overall people seemed very proud but the one person who wasn't was the person from the Jewish Defense League Bob Candleman who said that was a melodramatic mess that he didn't think accurately portrayed the results <laughs> That is so excellent. I, I, I hate to I hate to cut this off. I wish we could talk all day because both of these students have done such amazing work. But the next session begins in six minutes. So I've been instructed to move along and to uh, ask people to log out and then back in for the next session. And yes, I'm sorry to cut everybody off, but um, this was- really I actually don't even think, thank you so much, Amy and everyone. I don't think you have to log out. You can just, oh, if okay. you plan to stay and come back in five minutes, which I hope everyone who can um, will do, just 